You are listening to the People Centric Podcast, where we talk through the toughest challenges that people face at work and give practical advice to fixing those challenges. Thanks for joining our movement to create workplaces that are happier, healthier, aligned, and empowered by putting people at the center of all that we do. Welcome, people-centric leaders, uh, the people-centric podcast here. We're excited that you're with us. Uh, I am Philip Herzog, engagement specialist. And on our call today, we have Bethany Taff, Diana Royalty, and Stephanie Anderson. Um, Our topic is on effective listening. So in the communications world, that's some of my background. And we often say there's a large difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is a physical thing that happens. You might hear sounds, you might hear, uh, you know, just different things in your life, whether you mean to or not. But listening is different. Listening takes intention. And I would say it's a skill that all of us on our call say, we could probably do better. Uh, Honestly, although one name came out, Bethany Taff, of those who are here, about people who are good at listening. So Bethany, you're going to have to talk about yourself for a second. Why, uh, what is it about your listening that helps us know you're a good listener? Oh, so why do you guys think I'm a good listener? Yeah. Why, why do you think, think I'm a good listener? <laughs> I don't know. Why do you guys think I'm a good listener? <laughs> I have several um, answers for that. You're an amazing listener. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to expound on that? Only I'm if listening. you want me to. Listen more. <laughs> Um, Yeah. So Bethany, you have the most insane ability to hear people without assigning intent to what they're saying. Like I have never met somebody who can hear really harsh things and still not take offense to them and just like hear what's going on underneath, or at least you just don't seem to, I don't know. Yeah, that's good. That's nice. I'm glad that you, that's what you see. (laughs) That's what we see. Right. (laughs) And then you often do this thing where you like ask a question that's very pointed toward the thing underneath the thing, right? The thing underneath the charged emotion or the actual words. And then you ask this really wonderful question for clarity. And then I know that you have heard me and not my emotion. Like it's just, Mm -hmm. you're amazing at it. And I don't know how you do it, but yes, Mm -hmm. you listen without intent. You ask this very great follow-up questions for clarity and you keep asking the questions until you get the clarity um you you actively listen you you nod you have non-verbals you look at me in the face I mean you're just like really good at all of those things but I don't know you're an amazing thanks. listener oh thanks that's nice yeah. well see that's good because I probably would I don't know if I would have answered that question exactly the same way so I appreciate that but I think that's a I mean it's a good point to think about the you know that listening is like yeah obviously there's nonverbals and you can appear to be listening <laughs> to somebody else when they're talking to you and also it is the so whenever I start coaching you know we're just diving right in here Philip but um you know when we start coaching with somebody I always tell people on that first call that we do that really I just want to hear like I'm just here to I'm here to listen especially during the first call definitely the ones after two, but especially the first call, all I want, I want to just listen. I'm not going to say a lot. I'm just going to ask you questions because I may have some context about this person going into it, but I want to make sure I get their perspective on what their world looks like um, coming in and not just start coming at them with here. I think you need to change this and this and this and this to be successful in whatever. I kind of need to know where they're starting from first. And so being able to ask some of those questions, um, to hear from them, um, I think is really important and just effective communication, which I, which is why we're talking about this, right? Um, it's, this is, this is only one piece of communication and I think it's super undervalued, um, portion we often talk about just the other side of communication all the other pieces of it whether that's just like how you speak and your body language and the different methods of communication and email communication and you know that those those etiquette things and we often don't prioritize the listening aspect the actually the not talking side of things so I'm glad we're talking about this 
as right. you were talking to Diana <clears throat> um, about just Bethany style or just talking about good the listening in general, I was thinking good listening is like a Doppler radar, right? Like it, there's things out there that it can pick up on that maybe if you're just asking, you don't always, if you're asking with your own preconceived idea, you may not be listening for it. Um, and we've talked recently, I think in several podcasts about feedback and coaching and management and hard conversations. And I think the underlying tool that all of those can go better with uh, is like this, just effective listening. And so Stephanie, I would love to hear from you too. Um, what does effective listening look like to you? Oh yeah, good question. Um, I feel like I've been listening so far, which is fun. And I'm trying to challenge myself to like listen more today. Because if you listen to the podcast a lot, I get excited and I want to say something and I jump in, um, which makes sometimes effective listening a challenge for me because I get excited um, by ideas really easily. Um, and so when people are talking and an idea comes up or like whether someone presents one or I think of one, um, I will tend to jump in. And so I think also a part of effective listening that maybe we haven't hit on yet is like a lot of times as teams, we're trying to solve things, right? We're working on problems. Some things come up. We're trying to find a solution or how do we work out this new opportunity and also making sure that we're actually listening to the ideas that are, are being shared and we're asking questions. I would say like that was one thing um, when we asked earlier, like I agree with Diana on Bethany, like Bethany will ask really good questions um, and does it in a way where she's not assuming she knows even what that person means when they just said something. Um, so I think that's another part of effective listening is just beyond even assigning a tent. It's not assuming, you know, where someone's going with the thought or what they mean by a thought and letting them actually finish it before you jump in, um, and say, oh yeah. And, and then you add, add your thing to it. And I will say that's one thing I have to chronically work on because I grew up in a family where if you did not jump in the conversation as somebody's like ending their sentence, then you were never going to be heard. And we talk over each other and it's all those things. And so I would say as my family, it's not that we're bad listeners, but we practice bad listening skills. We've got some bad habits there sometimes that I think make it hard um, to like when you're talking to our family, to be honest, to feel like that we're actually listening to you and we're not thinking of where we want to take the conversation next. So I think that's a huge, huge part of listening is just actually being in the conversation and not thinking about, okay, where am I going next with this? What idea am I going to share next? How am I going to build upon that? And actually just listening. And sometimes that means you won't have the right thing to say right after that person is done, but that can be a really powerful thing too, just to pause and say like, you know, let me think about that for a second. You totally just said two things that I think most people don't recognize about themselves is that when other people are talking, are you thinking about what you're going to say next? Or are you thinking about what they're saying? And I oh, think yeah. natural inclination is to think about what we are going to say next so that we have something ready and something valuable to add, right? But I think a lot of people don't recognize that they do that right away. And the other thing that you said was you might want to take a pause. And I thought we should interject here and talk about the power of that pause. Yeah. And I will say um, the pause is uncomfortable for me. And um, there's a lot of research out there. So if you want to look this up, there's a lot of really good research out there about the power of the pause or the power of silence when you're speaking. And um, knowing that in the US, like we barely pause, maybe even like a second when someone stops speaking and we jump in and we actually did this um, preparing for this. I was like, okay, I'm going to talk and then I'm going to stop talking and Philip and Bethany count to three. And even three seconds felt really long. And knowing that in some cultures, they pause up to eight seconds in between. And I would just challenge you, like, just even counting to three, when like, if, if someone else finished speaking before you start speaking, count to three. And I mean, like a good three, like one, two, three, not one, two, three. Um, and it feels like an eternity. And so if it makes us uncomfortable, like why would we do it? And why is it powerful and effective? And I think for everybody on our team, we probably have some different responses that we would say like why it hits us personally. Um, 
for me, um, I try to remember to pause because again, like if I'm talking about, I'm a very ideas driven person. I'm a very futuristic and strategic person. I like to think about what's the outcome of this going to be? What are we going to do next? What are we going to do there? And sometimes because of that, I'm thinking really fast inside my own head and I'm not bringing other people along with me. And so if I don't pause, then it makes it seem like maybe I came to this conversation prepared for all of these things. And I wasn't really listening to your ideas, or I wasn't really willing to consider your ideas because I wasn't listening. Like it makes it seem like I'm not listening. If I just come up with everything so fast. And so it feels almost, um, like disingenuous in, in some ways. And so I think the power of the pause when someone is done sharing something with you, um, and especially if it's an idea or something they've experienced, like, give it that two or three seconds. And just like the first thing that should come out of your mouth after the pause is like acknowledging what they said and mirroring that back before you share your idea. So that way, even if you do have a great idea and you don't need time to think about it necessarily, you're acknowledging that you heard them and you actually absorbed what they told you and you're building upon it versus just saying like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's my idea. Yeah. And you and I are very different. You're, you're the one that will like speak up very quickly. And I'm the one that's like, I need seven minutes to think through all of this. Cause yeah. you just say my brain is moving very fast. My brain is also moving very fast. I don't think that part's different. I think it's that we're thinking about different things and mine, my brain is 37 steps down the road. I have a signed intent. I believe I understand everything and I have to take a minute and be like, okay, what are we trying to solve? What are we trying to do? What is my role here? And I have to think about all those, those things before I speak. And even then I still might be 12 steps down the road of implementing something that we haven't even really decided on yet. Right. So I think we're both, um, our brain, I think everyone's brains are moving very fast in conversations and it's that pause that helps everyone's brains just like for a moment try to focus where it should be focused. Yeah. Yeah. And one interesting piece of research that I pulled up for this is that they were talking um, about short-term memory. So in terms of like retaining information, the pause can be really important because um, it says our short-term memories can only hold a few pieces of information and only for around 30 seconds. So when you, when there's like speakers, especially if you're thinking of public speaking or you're presenting in front of your team or in a team meeting, if you don't pause, you are actually negatively impacting your listeners' comprehension because you're not giving them enough time to store all of that. Yes. Which I think that's, man, the first thing that came to my mind whenever you said that is like the way, this is not the main concept of this particular podcast, but I think the way we receive content right now, like especially on social media, I my brain can't even process all the things that I'm seeing. And I'm recognizing it more and more lately that like some of the content that's being thrown at me, like, I mean, like just in Instagram or like TikTok videos or something that I'm like, actually might be really helpful information. I often don't have time to like actually absorb all that they're trying to put in these little blips of of videos and stuff so anyway that's what made me think of that um as far as the pause piece of it I also think that this is like a really good magic trick to use with people too whenever you're having a conversation and you want I mean you kind of were wanting to learn about somebody or learn about a situation that maybe happened and you're just trying to get more information um even just letting the letting there be a pause when the other person is done speaking, because I think a lot of times whenever you may ask a question and somebody's sharing some information and they hit, they stop their like stream of consciousness stops. But instead of jumping in to say the next thing or ask the next question, like even letting there be a breath there, because then you're going to probably get some really good information after that because it's like here's the first the thing that was at the front of my head but then what's behind that and usually there's a lot of really valuable information to be learned from that person that they're like processing out loud um, and then able to kind of formulate like what what all's behind that in their next breath but if you don't if you don't pause and let that breath happen 
you may never get you may never get to that sort of like deeper level of of information if that makes sense that's so close. It reminds me, you know, when my iPhone restarts, there's always the warning with the new iOS and it says, do not turn off your phone before this finishes downloading. Uh, but I think in conversation, we treat it so differently, right? But you're like, download is almost complete, Bethany. Uh, and then we're like, no, no, I'm going to jump in. And that messes up software. So I've learned. Uh, I have tech issues all the time. So that that's definitely an experience I have I've gone through many times. I also love, Stephanie, how you said earlier on, hey, I will jump into a conversation quickly when I'm excited. It's a compliment. And also, I will pause out of respect for you. It's a compliment. Um, and I love that when we talk about communication styles, Matt and Don and our whole team, we talk about these things, you know, whether it's uh, for like executive leadership teams or managers or people at the front line, we all communicate. We all have our styles. One of the starting slides is that they estimate 75% of all communication is misinterpreted. And I love that stat because it doesn't say that it's ignored or disagreed with, but misinterpreted. And to Bethany's story, how often we're in the middle of something, if you don't get the full idea, you probably leave thinking something that the communicator, the one sending the message, uh, didn't fully meet, right? Or how many times a lot of conversations and meetings are like a slog or a swamp of a million half finished ideas. Um, and that can really do some damage uh, and then it makes things less meaningful. So I'm curious for all of us too. Diana, you mentioned, you know, we all have these, uh, we all have moments where we're slow to pause or we're maybe not good at listening because in our on our head, we're thinking of the response and there's like a pressure to do that. Whether we're doing a podcast, whether we're in conversations, phone calls, whatever it is with clients, with family. Um, I'm really curious, why do we all think that's the way no one ever told us you have to have a really good answer right when finish right when someone finishes saying something so why do we do that and how do we undo it you're you're right no one's ever said like you must know the answer immediately no one's ever said that but i think there's something about i don't know maybe watching tv or or i don't know there's something in our human communication pattern where we feel like we must respond immediately, right? It's that also that awkward thing. You said some cultures wait eight seconds and I was like, oh my gosh, that feels like an eternity. And I would also love that. Can we practice it? Like, that's amazing. Um, but I sidetracked. So you're right. I think that no one has ever said you have to do that, but there's something ingrained in maybe Americans. I don't, I didn't know other cultures waited longer, but there's something ingrained in us that says, you have to know immediately. You have to, you have to do this. You have to do it well and you have to be smart and you have to know what's next and you have to bring value to a conversation. So I think we do mm -hmm. respond immediately. I've kind of learned the trick of I love I I repeat back what they said to give my brain more time, mm -hmm. or I'll say something like, give me just a second to process that. And people seem to be totally open to that. And receptive to that, but I do have found that if I don't say something immediately, people are like, "Did you hear me? Are you there? Were you listening?" <laughs> yes, I was listening. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking. Yeah. I well, you know, we do we do like trainings and workshops, and we're facilitating lots of different types of meetings and things like that. And I think the tendency is even for us sometimes we have to be you know remind ourselves of this um but a, within a lot of organizations when we watch like different meetings and those interactions is like sometimes leaders get really frustrated when their people don't respond <laughs> right away or they're not super vocal in a meeting or something like that and and kind of equate that with um engagement or disengagement or whatever um which is not true really and what we've discovered is it's not necessarily yes it does it could be a really great sign of engagement if your people are quick to speak up and answer questions and all of that but not necessarily like like to diana's point just because people are not um maybe answering all the question is like maybe you just have a room full of processors or maybe we didn't you know like prep people well enough to actually have this conversation yet that doesn't mean that they won't be able to jump in and be able to have a more free-flowing conversation going forward um or maybe us as a facilitator whoever's leading a meeting just has to be more comfortable and open with just some of the like open spaces some of the pausing that we're talking about and things like that and know that like it's okay if we have some pauses here and there 
Um, and so you're right. It's a really interesting expectation that we put on um, ourselves and on people um, in these different dynamics and in the workplace and and things like that of like, oh, if we were in a meeting and I maybe didn't know Diana very well <laughs> and how she worked. And I was like, why is Diana never talking until like the end of the meeting? And then she, you know. Which is not always true. That's not how you always I mean, show up. Diana's meeting. never talking. And then in the end, she just like blows everything up because she thinks all of it was bad and never said anything. I have to process all of the information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but see, I, but see, we know that about yeah. Diana. So yeah. anyways, those are and my I also, I also noticed that sometimes people, if I don't respond, people internalize what that means, right? So you have to be clear about why you're pausing because I think people will get self-conscious about it. They'll say things like, oh my God, did I say something wrong? Do I look stupid? Is she going to fire me? Right. Whatever the situation is, it, it, if, if they don't know why you're pausing, then they'll internalize the pause. And so I think it's important that as good listeners practicing the pause, that we also give context for the pause, you know? There's also, a, there's an urgency, I think that happens with whether it's meetings or business at one of my little hidden theories, you know, we don't work with that many fire departments. We've worked with a city that has a fire department. So that counts, but there's so many people we meet who say every day, I just put out fires. I put out fires for firefighters. You're like, but you don't actually own a fire truck, right? You haven't actually had a fire for a while, not a literal one. I mean, I think a lot of it is that we interact uh, on the day-to-day -day with very little margin sometimes, almost brinkmanship like um, and I think that also adds to just this urgency of like, we got to figure this out. We've got to get this done. We've got to move on. Um, and so if I think to your all's point, it feels awkward, but I think it also in my mind, there's sometimes that thought we don't have time. We need a solution now. I don't have three seconds to pause, Stephanie. Um, but eight that's- seconds is an eternity. Right. <laughs> if we practice eight seconds now, I can't even count that high right now because there's too many important things to do, right? I just can't. And then I just took eight seconds and totally missed my moment to jump in and say something quippy. <laughs> <laughs> there is no hope if you wait eight seconds. Uh, yeah, just, just for the record, American culture is not one of the cultures where we do an eight second pause normally. So just to say that um, if you do that with your teams, people are probably going to stare at you and be like, you good? Did you, did you freeze? Did something happen? Uh, but but try, okay? try three seconds. Yeah. I like that we've talked about uh, different styles and pauses. And I'm also curious, uh, we've given some really great best practices and tips. Um, but what are other ways? It's awkward maybe to tell someone, hey, this is how you can listen better, right? So far, we've been talking about how I can improve my listening skills be a good listener. We always say people centric. One of the first steps to listening well is to acknowledge that you are probably wrong about something, or you could be wrong in every conversation you have. So the humility that someone else might know more. So that inspires listening. But what are tips you all have, whether it's coaching or feedback, when you're trying to help someone else improve on their own listening? Okay. So Don, our leader is a very good listener. Um, and he loves context and he loves all of the details. And he also loves the big picture. Like he's a great listener. Uh, but I, as a processor, if I am, when we have conversations, if I have a lot of things to tell him, I go into the conversation and say something like, I'm about to throw a lot out there, but I need to throw it all out there. And th so like, please don't, I need to, I need to get it all out before you say something. And he'll be like, okay, great. Like, no problem. But I've learned that if I, say that ahead of time, people will listen better in my, in my opinion, they're listening better. I don't know if that's really true, but it feels <laughs> like they're trip. listening better. And it feels like I can get out what's in my brain better without, without them feeling like they need to respond as quickly. So I think that's a, that's a trick that I've been using as a processor who needs to go from one point to another without interruption or whatever. Um, to just sort of say, I need you to not speak for a minute. <laughs> yes. Um, I, this trick has been used on me as well. 
it is effective. Um, and I will also say like, I am married to someone who is very much a processor. And so sometimes he will have to tell me that sometimes, okay, I need to tell you the story. I need to do this thing. And I need you just like, listen until I'm done. And now do I do that perfectly? No, I often interrupt them because I'm like, wait, what? And th they said that. And how did they, huh? And he's like, can you just, can you just, because if I get to the end, then I think this will all make sense. And so I do think it really, really helps because if you're someone like me or Dawn, that like is idea and imagination focused, Sometimes you lose us in the conversation when we can't see where the story is going. And I will fully admit to sometimes checking out in the middle of a long story or something because I can't see where we're going with it. And I just figure at that point that a lot of the middle is probably irrelevant and I just need to tune back in for the end and I can probably put the puzzle pieces together, which I know as I'm saying that out loud, Diana is like 70, that is so bad. And I'm just, I'm trying to be vulnerable for the podcast here, people, because I know I'm not the only one. And this you're is something not the only one. This is so common. And I'm glad you're being honest. Yeah. Because like, it's something I'm aware that I do though. And that's where I guess I will say like to, to commend myself a little bit, like it would be bad if I didn't know and acknowledge that I do that, but I know that I do that and I know that I will check out. And so it's really helpful for me, when Diana is about to give a long list or, or give a long narrative before we can problem solve or before we can discuss, because it helps me know, okay, I actually need to listen to all of this, not just listen to the bookends and then fill in the middle based because I'm probably right. Right. Um, so I, that is really, really helpful for me, for someone to tell me that, because then I listen, um, to the whole thing. Because again, I just know that's my natural habit and where my brain goes. And it's something I have to be conscious of. Um, I think in that vein too, we'll talk to people a lot who are like, we'll go to somebody on their team or their manager, or somebody in their life, and they want to bring up a big topic. And they'll be like, well, they just, they weren't listening to me. You know, they were doing something else. They checked their phone or their email while they were doing that. And those are their reasons for why they didn't listen to you. Um, and so I would agree just to say that really quickly is like part of good listening is undivided attention. So like, don't do other stuff while someone's talking to you. But I think something that you can do to help someone know you need their undivided attention is to tell them again at the top like what you're going to talk about. And if it is something really important to you or something that has emotions attached to it, tell them that because most people then will close the browser, put down their phone or like put away whatever they're working on. If you tell them like, Hey, I need to talk to you about something like really important. That's been really bothering me that I, I want to find a solution for I can coming for your advice. Like if you tell them that, then I think people it's a good signal, right? That they, you really need their undivided attention. Yeah. Don is really good at doing that with me because I'm like a, he'll call me at a random time and he'll be like, Hey, I need to talk to you about something. Are you in the middle of something that you don't want to drop right now so that we can have this intentional conversation? Or do I need to schedule time for that? Like he's very good about picking up on the right time and place to have that conversation. And so I think if, other people can do that too, right? That's a, that's a key tip. Go ahead and say, are you in the right headspace for this? Is this the right time for this? Is this the right place for this? Make sure that you've been intentional about where and when and how you set that up. Yeah. That's really good. I, I, these are kind of loud listener uh, topics, right? Like how do you be a loud listener? Um, if you're focused and paying attention, um, it's definitely like that you said two different nonverbals. Some people will, you know, you'll be in a meeting and then afterward you're like, were they even listening? They, they weren't on their phone, but they were just sitting there. How dare they? And you might find out later, like, no, they just don't need to run around and fidget. They were thinking the whole time. They were still, they were putting their energy into ideas or solutions or different pieces there. Um, I'm really curious, maybe as we round out on our last uh, question, um, what would you say for you um, is the best, is like the best 
listening experience you've ever been a part of? I don't know if that's like a weird question, but like a time, I, I kind of the idea of what was coming to my mind. Um, there was, a per, I, I met a guy here in town. His name is Dr. Roy Lloyd. And he was a part of a group that created an international forgiveness institute. So it was a cross-cultural, it was cross-generational. I mean, one of the things that they would do, I mean, they would take people who'd been in very serious situations like wars, literally two groups of people, get them on the same call, same meetings together, and they would literally talk and listen. And what was crazy, if you go to meet and kind of create reconciliation in a setting like that, deep offenses, people literally died because of people sitting across the table from you. Um, how do you have a conversation there? If you're not able to listen, you literally can't. There's no common ground, right? Like deep blood issues. And I think we have people that would say, uh, maybe not to that level, but no, I'm not going to sit down and listen to that person, right? Like there's a professional grievance or I'm frustrated and I don't trust them. Um, and what he said, he would like sit down and what Dr. Roy would do um, is basically host this conversation in a way where they would get to the end. And not everyone all the time would say, wow, I am so glad to know you now, a friend across the table. Um, but they were able to have dialogue and start to process some of the things that happen. And he said, for some people, it actually did lead to friendships and relationships, which was really meaningful. And then again, others, like a couple of times it would end in screaming matches and they had to separate people. It didn't go perfectly every time either, right? Um, and so I don't know if that's a great example, because to be quite honest, uh, I actually can't remember what he said he did that made this. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't listening enough, but it happened. That's amazing. Uh, well, <laughs> it makes me think of, I mean, you know, this is an election year, so we won't go down that train too far. But um, but I think that this is a really good tool to be thinking about and to use not only professionally, but personally, too. And I I do think we've talked about that a little bit before, too, of like, how do how do we listen to your point? I think Philip with that story too is like how do we how do we listen to people in a way that um just provides that clarity that is open to perspective that doesn't assume the worst about the other person but thinks like you know what maybe we're on different sides of the spectrum what you know and whatever that whatever that means whether it's something at work or whether it's politically or whatever whatever it is but how did, but if you just begin to be curious about how did that person get there? I'm not trying to debate somebody, but I need to understand how they got there, which I think gives, gives, um, it just creates compassion. I think uh, if you do this well and you're open to just having a conversation with somebody um, to learn more about them. So I know we talk about that. Just be curious too. And I think that's a really big part of effective listening. Yeah. And I don't know about like the, the time that I was listened to the best or anything. I mean, I, I think, you know, my husband's a good listener. Dawn's a good listener. Our team generally is like good listeners because we all care a lot. Um, but I think it's, I think the reason those people are good listeners is because we do care. And so I think there is something in that of like, you have to care about the conversation to be a good listener. So if you genuinely are like, I don't care about this. I don't care what you have to say. I don't want to hear what you have to say. You're not going to be a good listener. So you have to find some level of like, this is important to me because, you know. I agree. And Philip, when you were telling your story, um, how he made the distinction between like listening and agreement. And I think that in our culture, sometimes, yeah, like we're, we're pretty bad sometimes about saying, oh, if I even, if I even listen to that person's point, or if I even listen, Bethany, to what you were saying to like how they got there, that in some way I'm agreeing with them or I'm complicit or whatever. And that's just simply not true at all. You can still really listen to someone, ask thoughtful questions and get to the end and say, okay, yeah, you know, I think we are different in that way, or I don't think we have the same values on, on this particular issue or topic, or we see that in a different way. Um, and that is still a really respectful way to still listen. And you might disagree, or even if you're doing this at work, right? Like you might not agree on what the best way to handle a specific situation is, or what the best way forward is, but you still need to listen and understand the perspectives. And I think we're all better 
when we, we do that, um, you know, when we actually listen to the different perspectives and we take into consideration other people's lived experiences and feelings, and, you know, we may not agree on everything. And again, that's not the point, the point of listening either is to get our way. Cause if you're just going in to get your way, um, you're not listening. Oh, so many good final comments. I feel like we could make a whole series of podcasts uh, just based on that. Listening does not mean agreeing. Um, I did not do this. I did not forget Dr. Roy Lloyd's comment for, you know, like dramatic effect, but it came to me while you were all talking because I was being a bad listener. Uh, Dr. Roy Lloyd had this uh, acronym, WAIT, W-A-I-T. He said, you know, one thing that helps anyone in those settings is to think, wait, why am I talking? Uh, in your response to someone. Because if our tendency is to just blurt something out, pause and say like, why am I talking? What am I saying? What am I adding? What's going on here? Uh, That can help too. So people-centric leaders, we hope that this has been a great session for you. You were clearly listening. Um, We are always here to help if you have more questions about communication. And thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for listening to the People Centered Podcast. We are so grateful for you joining us every week. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Also, feel free to share on your social media with everyone that you know. It really does help us. If you would like to contact us, I have put our information in the show notes. Please reach out anytime. We love hearing from you. We will be back next week with a new topic. Until then... Be well and lead well.